Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, King of kings and Lord of lords, maker of the sun and the moon and the stars, and the one who walked up the hill to be the sin bearer in our place. Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, our Savior. We do lift up our voices to you even now, though weak they may be, frail they may be. In this condition, in in this life, our motives are mixed, our perspectives are skewed, our feet are clay. We are here on the earth. How we long for our voices to resonate with the songs of heaven, and one day they shall. Lord, as we look to your word even now, would you fuel worship in our hearts, in this room, and then send us out to take the glories of your name and your work to this dying world. Use your word powerfully in our hearts this morning for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you're finding your seat, find your way to the last book of the Bible and the fifth chapter. We're looking this morning at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. As we've been making our way through this throne room scene in heaven, still yet future, we were confronted with the question, who is worthy? Who is worthy to open the scroll, to break its seals, to usher in God's series of judgments against the earth, to pave the way for the return of the king? Who could open the scroll? And in verse 5, the weeping stopped from the prophet. The anticipation of all of heaven ceased. And there was the discovery. One who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals. None other than the lion of the tribe of Judah the descendant of David, rightful king of the earth, rightful heir to the Davidic throne. What makes this Judean, this descendant of David, the only one qualified to usher in God's future judgment of the world? Twenty men have sat on the throne of David since David. None were able to fulfill the promises of the Davidic covenant. None were worthy to execute the final phase of human history. None could prepare the earth for the kingdom. They ruled in history. Only one is worthy to take the throne who rules history itself. None in heaven, none on earth, none under the earth were found who could stand up and dare to take the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. None but the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. The fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. We begin this morning in Revelation 5 verse 6 to see precisely why he alone is qualified to open the scroll and to break its seals. This will unfold in the rest of chapter 5. We will focus this morning on verse 6. Read with me God's word. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Why is the line of Judah worthy to take the scroll? Well, notice, first of all, his position Notice his position in verse 6. John begins by saying, and I saw. This is the third time we have that phrase in this chapter. It continually draws our attention to a new facet of this scene. And it narrows our attention, focuses our attention this time to Jesus. To Jesus the Christ. And his position, according to verse 6, is in the middle of the throne and of the four living beings. And in the middle of the elders. 
These are spatial designations. Where do we find the Lion of Judah? He is, quite literally, in the middle of the throne. Remember the cherubim and Ezekiel's vision of this same scene seem almost to be part of the throne, in the foundation of the throne, supporting it and, and moving with it in its four directions. These same beings, called fiery ones or seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6, are in the inner circle of the throne room and ministering to God in the heavenly temple in closest proximity to Him, crying out, Holy, Holy, Holy. And here, the Lion of Judah is said to be in the middle of it all, in the middle of the throne, literally in the center of the throne. And this might be perhaps challenging to visualize, Remember, this is a vision, and John is recording what he sees. So he actually sees something, and the details that he sees convey realities. Jesus is portrayed in the midst of the throne. That means he's, he's in the center of the circle of those four living beings. And he is in the center of the larger circle of the 24 elders on thrones surrounding the throne. The lion is the center of attention. In fact, look over at Revelation 7:17. 7, the Lamb, listen to this, in the center of the throne. Again, giving us that spatial designation of his location. And back in chapter 3, verse 21, in the letter to Laodicea, we, we heard this from Jesus. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his thrones. On his throne, singular. Those are two different thrones in that passage. There is a throne belonging to Messiah that believers will reign with him on. And there is a throne of his father that Jesus already sits on. This is in keeping with the Bible's testimony about where Jesus is. In, in the incarnation, he took on human flesh. In his resurrection, he has a human body, and in his ascension and exaltation, he is forever joined to a human body. Jesus has omnipresence in his spirituality, but he has a location in his human body, and that location is here at the throne with his Father. This is the fulfillment of Psalm 110. After finishing his priestly work of sacrifice, he would be seated at the right hand. And Hebrews 1.3 says, after he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. There are two persons depicted on one throne here. The Lord God, the Almighty, is seated on his throne. And the Son, said to be in the center of that throne, who has also been seated, is in this future scene now standing. Now, some ambiguity or mystery seems to be present in all of this. So we might wonder, who is it that's sitting on the throne? In fact, in, in my library of books on Revelation, they're split 50-50 between saying the Father is seated on the throne and the Son is seated on the throne. You know, which one is it? And, and I think the answer is yes. In fact, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah the prophet viewing this scene 700 years before Christ came to earth the first time, he said, and I saw the Lord, Adonai, high and lifted up. Later in that same book, he would, he would call the servant as high and lifted up. And then John 12, 41, the apostle John tells us that Isaiah saw Jesus in his glory in that scene. Who's on the throne? God Almighty is on the throne. Who's on the throne? Jesus, the risen Christ, is on the throne. And, and in this text, in the center of the throne, if we understand Christ to be located spatially here at the throne with the Father, right in the middle of the throne, as Jesus himself testified in 321, as he's described in Revelation 717, and then later at the end of the book of Revelation in the eternal state in Revelation 21 and 22, the throne, singular, is said to be the throne of God and of the Lamb. And then we see all of this fitting together. God is seated on the throne. Christ is on the throne too, right in the middle of it. And now from the center of the heavenly throne emerges the only one worthy to reign on the earth. And the bottom line in all of this is this. The one who will sit on David's throne is the one who already sits on heaven's throne. He reigns with the Father in heaven. He will reign on the earth in his kingdom. No one is sitting on David's throne right now. 
The Bible's very specific about this. The throne of David is a political rulership over the nations of the earth, capitaled in Jerusalem in a united Israel, reunited Israel. That has never yet happened. That rulership has not taken place. The, the throne of David, as it were, is empty. It is not politically located. It will be, and Jesus will sit on that throne. And John here, the, 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 the prophet, has been ushered into the future scene of the coronation and the preparation of the installment of the king on the earth. So here we see the rightful owner of the earth stand to take the scroll from his father. The lion of Judah and the root of David will prepare the earth for his own return. He will right the wrongs, straighten the crooked, humble the proud, punish the guilty, rescue the saints, reverse the curse. The government will be on his shoulders and his kingdom will have no end. John turns his eyes to view the lion. And what does he see standing? Look down at verse six. And I saw in the middle of the throne and the four living creatures and in the middle of the elders a lamb. If we're to understand why this one is worthy to open the scroll, we must not only notice his position at the center of the throne, we must also remember his passion, his passion. And, and by his passion, I, I mean his death on the cross. We are driven here by this vision of a lamb back to Calvary, back to the first coming of Messiah when he came not as conquering king, but as sacrificial lamb sent to die as payment to God for the sins of his people. This is startling. It takes your breath away. John was expecting to behold a lion. We were expecting to read the description of the king of beasts, regal, royal, mighty, majestic, terrifying. Instead, we take in the sight of a lamb. Compared to lions, lambs are little, weak, vulnerable, compliant. They're made for sacrifice. Designed by God in the Old Testament sacrificial system as innocent substitutes to suffer vicariously in the place of sinners. In fact, in the Old Testament, according to theologian Robert Raymond, 85 out of 96 times a lamb appears in the Old Testament. It is for sacrifice. In the animal world, lions and lambs are opposites. Lions are ravenous carnivores at the top of the food chain. Sheep are the food chain. The fearsome predator and the defenseless prey. The roar of a wild lion melts your courage and makes your knees quake. The sheep is silent before its shearers. It's a popular phrase in our day, be lions, not sheep. Why? These are incongruous beasts. They, they don't go together. They're not the same picture. They're radically different. How can such opposite creatures depict one and the same purpose, uh, one and the same person. How do these characteristics go together? You see, in the person of Jesus Christ, there are contrasts in his person. Not contradictions, but profound contrasts. As Omri Miles has said, there is beauty in the contrast. He is incomparable. There is no one like him. Who could you compare to Jesus when Jesus can be thought of as a lion and a lamb? Jonathan Edwards took up this theme in a sermon he preached called The Excellency of Christ. I won't re-preach the entirety of that sermon, but I will give you his outline this morning. He said that Christ depicted as a lion and a lamb seem to be two incompatible pictures and yet they find their compatibility singularly, uniquely, in Jesus Christ. He says there exists in Christ divergent qualities, what he calls an admirable conjunction of diverse excellencies. That sounds very Edwardsian. He describes first Jesus' infinite highness and his infinite condescension. You, you cannot measure how infinitely high above creation Jesus is. And Jesus crossed that infinite gap in his condescension. 
Edwards says, Christ, as he is God, is infinitely great and high above all. He's higher than the kings of the earth, for he is king of kings and lord of lords. He's higher than the heavens and higher than the highest angels of heaven. So great is he that all men, all kings and princes, are as worms of the dust before him. And yet, Edward says, he is of infinite condescension. He condescends to angels and even to people. And not just the noblest and the highest of people, but the lowest, the poorest children and beggars. Edwards encourages us to think about our human condescension. We're all just people, and yet we treat each other with disdain. Maybe you've thought of yourself as better than someone else. Just think about that for a moment. Edwards says, if one worm be a little exalted above another by having more dust or a bigger dunghill, how much does he make of himself? What a distance does he keep from those that are below him? And as Edwards says, if a person does condescend for the benefit of another, he then wants everybody to make a big deal out of it. But Christ, when he condescended, did so by taking our nature, becoming one of us, making himself the servant of us. He washed his disciples' feet. He went to the cross. He who is infinitely high became supremely low. The second heading of Edward's sermon is his infinite justice and infinite grace. Here is one who hates sin with infinite just hatred of sin, and he will leave no sin unpunished. He is the judge of the world. And yet he has forgiven sinners. He's forgiven infinite debts due to that justice. Staggering. Edwards then goes on to describe other characteristics in Christ that seem incompatible, the way a lion and a lamb seem like incompatible pictures of the same person. Here's Edwards' phrase. He says, Such really diverse excellencies which otherwise would have been thought to be utterly incompatible in the same subject infinite glory and lowest humility, infinite majesty and transcendent meekness, the deepest reverence toward God and equality with God, infinite worthiness of good and the greatest patience under sufferings of evil, an exceeding spirit of obedience with supreme dominion over heaven and earth, absolute sovereignty, and perfect resignation under the will of his Father. Self-sufficiency and entire trust and reliance on God. And then finally in his sermon, Edwards describes that these excellencies have been directed towards men in ways that would seem impossible to come from the same being. He describes in his incarnation, first of all, that Christ took on our nature, this infinite condescension, and yet Jesus had power over Satan. He sought to bring peace, and the end of his birth uh, was declared to be all of those by the angels. In his life and ministry, we see this same uh, contrast, uh, not a contradiction, but a contrast. His glory was cloaked, but sometimes that glory broke through the disguise. Healing the blind and lame, raising the dead, <laughs> teaching with authority and wisdom, wielding authority over Satan and demons. In his death we saw it. Ultimate humiliation and divine glory. The final weakness and yet supreme power, love to God and love to God's enemies. He appeared for divine justice, but he also suffered from divine justice. He was supremely holy, but treated as supremely guilty. He was dealt with as unworthy, but because of his death on the cross, he is counted as supremely worthy. He suffered most extremely for those towards whom he was then manifesting his greatest act of love. He was delivered over to the power of his enemies, but by that delivering over to the power of his enemies, he actually had victory over his enemies. And we see this also in Jesus' present exaltation at the right hand of God. He is in heaven in the highest place of glory, and yet he intercedes on behalf of saints as our advocate before the Father. And we will see this, of course, in Christ's return, 
his acts of judgment. He is perfectly just in punishing sin, yet with unending mercy towards us who are sinners, whose sins were paid for by his blood, we are forgiven. Notice Revelation 5, 6. He is a lamb standing as if slain. This is Jesus in the future, in heaven, still bearing the marks of his sacrificial death on the cross. That sacrifice which was demanded by God, provided for by God, condemned by God, and Jesus was simultaneously at the cross, abandoned by God, and visited by God in his wrath. Jesus forever bears the marks of that sacrificial death. Like the animals killed by God to cover Adam and Eve after they sinned, like the Passover lamb slaughtered by God to protect God's people from death in Egypt, like the uncountable numbers of lambs killed in the temple and the tabernacle for thousands of years, Jesus went like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep silent before its shearers, the innocent killed in the place of the guilty, the sinless punished in place of the sinful, the obedient crushed instead of the disobedient. He was pierced through, says Isaiah, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being was upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The one who will judge the world for sin is the one who was judged already for the sins of everyone who would believe. The one who rightfully condemns sinners for their godlessness and rebellion was already condemned as the sin bearer at the cross. And the resurrected, glorified, ascended Son of God forever bears the marks of his sacrificial death in our place. He is a slain lamb standing in the middle of the throne. Listen, this puts the death of Messiah at the center of celestial worship. His death is not just a historical event. It is the enduring center of attention in heaven. And it is that accomplishment, according to Revelation 5, that qualifies him to unfold future history, to take the scroll and to break its seals. Revelation 5, 6 gives us the first mention of a lamb in Revelation There would be 29 more mentions, 30 times total, that refer to Christ as a lamb. There is one use of the word lamb in Revelation that does not refer to Christ. Interestingly, it's of the false prophet in Revelation 13, 11. Here's a description. He has two horns like a lamb, but speaks as a dragon. What does that tell you? Satan is the great imitator. He puts out a false prophet to kind of look like Jesus to the world. He's got Satan's words in his mouth. 30 times from Revelation 5, 6 forward in this book, Jesus is referred to as the lamb. We might have expected the imagery to shift to a lion, a conquering lion, majestic and royal. But the book of Revelation just doesn't seem to get past the slain lamb of Calvary's cross. It is the lamb that is worshipped in Revelation 5. It is the lamb who opens the seal judgments in 6 and 7 and 8. It is the wrath of the lamb that is poured out in chapter 6 on the earth. It is the lamb who is worshipped and followed by the 144,000. It is the lamb who is at the center of the throne in chapter 7. It is the Lamb's book of life that contains the names of all the redeemed from the foundation of the world. It is the Lamb who stands on Mount Zion in chapter 14 with 144,000 in victory. It is the song of the Lamb that will be sung in chapter 15. It is the Lamb that overcomes in global warfare in chapter 17. It is the Lamb's marriage supper that occurs in 19. And get this, in the eternal state, in chapters 21 and 22, it is the throne of God and of the Lamb. Seven times in the eternal state, he's referred to as the Lamb. His people in the eternal state are the Lamb's bride. The new Jerusalem is the Lamb's city. The Lamb is the temple, and the Lamb is the lamp that is in that city. And forever and ever, the throne belongs to the Lamb. You see, history will never get past the reality that the King of Kings was the Lamb slain. In eternity future, heaven will not get over the sacrificial death of Christ. The lion of Judah and the slain lamb of Calvary are the same person. All of heaven does now, and all of creation will forever give him glory. 
as the king of kings and a sacrificial lamb slain. And notice this in verse 6. The sacrificial lamb is not dead. He's standing. He's not in a crumpled heap on the crystal pavement. He's on his feet. He is alive. But we will not gaze upon some monument to a martyr. You know, you go somewhere where somebody died for a cause and you read a plaque. Here lies William Wallace who gave up his life fighting for the Scots against English tyranny. We won't read a monument or a plaque. There will be no statue or memorial because Jesus was no martyr. He wasn't a victim whose death paved the way for others to survive. Jesus laid down his life and he took it up again. He stands in his resurrection. He is the one who says, I became dead and I am alive forevermore. He is victor, overcomer, risen, triumphant, now at the throne of God and ready to return to the earth with the trophies of his victory. And he stands, verse 6, as if slain. Literally, as having been slain. That is, he, he was slain and, and the effects of his slaughter remain, they endure. The effects on his own person and the effects that he won with that death. And we know that Jesus bore the cross wounds in his resurrection body. In John chapter 20, the disciples got to see it. You remember doubting Thomas. And, and there in Jesus' resurrection body are the, the nail prints in his hands and, and the wound in his side. And we like to heal. But heaven wants those marks to remain. The hymn sings it this way, rich wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. Jesus is at the heavenly throne now in the glorified beauty of his sacrificial death. In chapter 5, three more songs erupt. An explosion of worship, increasing in intensity, expanding in participation, eventually enlisting the praise of every created thing. And the doxology moves outward from the throne in concentric circles through the four living beings, the 24 elders, to the myriads of myriads of angels, to the uncountable numbers of redeemed from every tongue and tribe and nation and people, to every created thing in heaven and earth and below the earth. Even his enemies, will yield praise, not willingly. Worship will consume every corner of the cosmos. And the lamb, standing as if slain, is the theme of the songs. Look at verse 9, when that first song erupts. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. Why? Why? For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. It is the death of Christ on the cross that expressly qualifies him to take the scroll. His cross work informs his glory, according to Philippians 2. For this reason the Father highly exalted him. The slain lamb is at the center of attention in heaven's throne room and heaven never gets past it. The scars do not fade he is forever called the Lamb. He will forever be seen and adored as the one who died in the place of the redeemed. If we are to understand who is worthy to open the scroll and why he is worthy, we must not only notice his position, we must remember his passion. And thirdly, this morning, we must also perceive his power. Look again at verse 6. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Horns is a biblical image of power and strength, uh, like the horns on a ram or, or some brute animal. Seven horns here gives a picture of the fullness of strength. That is, the slain lamb is also the omnipotent one who possesses all authority in heaven and on earth to conquer and to reign. It's interesting in this imagery of Christ as lamb, he has these horns of strength. In the animal world, would a lamb be a good match for a dragon? For evil beasts? 
for all of the world's mechanized armies assembled together against him, would you put a lamb in the ring? But this is the great and glorious paradox of Christ. When Christ appears again on the earth, he will not be silent before his shearers. When he has his day, the skies will be rent, the sword of his mouth will waste his enemies, and the dragon, the beast, and the second beast, they will all fall, and the world's armies will become food for the birds. He will be invincible in his strength. The horns on this lamb portray his inexorable power. He is lion and lamb. Even in his lambness, he conveys this power. He is called the lamb in chapter 6 when his wrath is poured out on the earth. He is called the lamb in chapter 14 when he is victorious on Mount Zion. He is called the lamb in chapter 17 with all military might and divine authority. And he is still called the lamb on the eternal throne in the new heavens and new earth. In addition to this intrinsic might, He also commissions here in verse 6 his Holy Spirit to supernaturally, powerfully pave the way for his return. This is what John means when he describes the seven spirits of God, the seven eyes on this lamb sent into all the earth. Notice that the picture of seven eyes gets immediately described, the, the sevenfold spirit of God. This is a reference to Zechariah 3. There, there the seven eyes are depicted as God's supernatural working to actually remove iniquity from his people. And then in Zechariah 4, the, the seven spirits of God and the very presence of the throne room are seen as war torches going out through all the earth. What that depicts here for us, as John is picking up on Zechariah's imagery, is the powerful presence of the Spirit of God in His manifest fullness, accomplishing by supernatural might the preparation for the return of the King. The Spirit of God moves omnipresent, supernaturally powerfully, to pave the way for the return. And it's twofold, this preparation. It is a preparation of judgment and salvation. The Spirit, depicted as war torches going through the earth, he, he has a role in revealing sin and righteousness and judgment. But he is also the agent of regeneration, of new birth. Think about Ezekiel 36 and 37. In Ezekiel 36, you have the promise of the new covenant for Israel where their stony hearts are turned to fleshy hearts. What's required for that work? According to Ezekiel 36, the Spirit of God. And then in Ezekiel 37, you have the valley of the dry bones. That is, Israel in her apostate, spiritually dead state, hopeless, helpless, and dead. And the only hope for Israel is the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit where God puts flesh on bones. In other words, God makes alive that which is dead. What has to be done? Iniquity has to be paid for. New life must be given. Soft hearts must be made out of stony hearts. God promises to do all of that work. And the Spirit's work, according to Zechariah and according to Ezekiel and according to this imagery here in Revelation 5-6, the Spirit's work is to prepare the world and even particularly the nation of Israel for the return of the King. Now that will mean the trouble of judgment. Jeremiah 30 tells us that two-thirds of the nation will be cut off in unbelief, but the third that comes through will be born again, believing the gospel, singing Isaiah 53, we crucified our Messiah who believed our report. He was crushed for us. They'll sing it. They will say with Zechariah 14.10, we looked on him who was pierced, Yahweh who was pierced, and mourned for him as for an only son. A morning of repentance produced by the Holy Spirit of God. This is Jesus' powerful work. The commissioning of the Holy Spirit to prepare the way for the King. The Holy Spirit is Christ's agent for the supernatural work in the world. Where the rebellious squatters will be evicted. The repentant will be purified and prepared. And the King, the Lion, the Lamb will come and reign on the earth. And his people will love him. Don't you long for that day? We learn some theology in this passage. The, the point of this passage, obviously, is the coronation of the king, the, the presentation of the one worthy to take the scroll and usher in future judgment and the anticipation of his return to the earth in all glory. 
And yet we can observe some truths about God here. We, we don't want to miss. We learn, of course, of the deity of Christ. What do we see in Revelation 5? It's incontrovertible. He receives worship. He's at the thinner, center of the throne. He is in a place only God belongs. And those holy, sinless, fiery, terrifying beings surrounding him worship. They call him holy. And then the 24 elders on their thrones, they bow down before him in worship and cast their crowns. And then the angels worship. Look, nobody gets worshiped but God. <laughs> Very clearly, Jesus is God in this chapter. He's God all the time. This chapter portrays the deity of Christ in really striking ways. Additionally, Old Testament texts that speak properly about Yahweh are quoted again and again in this book and in this chapter about Christ. Theologically, we learn about the Trinity in this passage as well. You notice the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all simultaneously present in this scene. They are together, they are working together, and yet they are distinct we see here the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son as well as the Father. If you're curious about church history, that split the East and the West Church. Why is there a, a Western Roman Catholic Church and an Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church? They split over whether or not the Holy Spirit comes from Jesus. There were other problems. There was political problems. But historical footnote, uh, that could have been solved really easily in this verse. And then theologically, of course, we learn about substitutionary atonement. From revolu uh, from rever I can't even say the word. What am I looking for? Revelation. From Revelation 5 forward, Jesus is overwhelmingly referred to as the Lamb. It is as if heaven never is willing to get past the resurrected Jesus as a slain Lamb, standing as having been slain. Why does our God put a slain lamb on display forever and ever? Because the slain lamb is our God. He desires to put on display for all of eternity his self-emptying love, his grace, his kindness. He, he wants to forever showcase the infinite treasure of his goodness expressed to unworthy creatures. The slain lamb of the tribe of Judah is the reality to which all those Old Testament sacrifices looked forward. The slain lamb at Calvary was the dividing line, the watershed event, the defining point for all of human history. In fact, it marks out the eternal destiny of everyone who has ever lived. Your destiny eternally is determined by what you do with the slain lamb. The slain lamb is the conqueror of Satan and sin and death and sorrow and pain and brokenness and sickness. The slain lamb is the only reason any of us will ever see God. The lion of Judah and the lamb slain is the centerpiece of history. The lion of Judah and the lamb slain is the centerpiece of theology. The lion of Judah and the lamb slain is the centerpiece of eternity. Heaven will forever be ordered around the gospel of a slain lamb. The four living creatures never grow weary of worshiping the slain lamb. The 24 elders never get bored with the lamb. Myriads and myriads of angels will forever adore a slain lamb. And think about this, the angels and the four living creatures, and if the elders are heavenly beings, they've never been forgiven. They've never sinned. And yet they praise him for his unmatched character and his unique purposes in loving sinful creatures like us. God himself puts the spotlight of heaven on the slain, slain lamb. God is not tired of a slain lamb. He is not bored with the slain lamb. He never gets past a slain lamb. God never graduates from the gospel of the land slain at Calvary. Now we could say it this way, heaven never forgets the gospel, and neither should we. This is immensely practical for us. It's easy to drift. 
It's easy to drift from important things. It's even easy to drift from the most important thing, from the gospel. It can be easy to move past the gospel, push the gospel to the periphery. Some in our day made it for a while a fad to be gospel-centered. Where a focus on the death of Christ in the place of sinners sort of came and went. But this is the enduring reality of heaven for all eternity. 2,000 years have passed on this earth since the Lamb was slain at the cross of Calvary. Churches have come and gone. Individuals, organizations, institutions, movements, nations have embraced the gospel and moved on from the gospel. Listen, all of human history is rushing unshakably toward the exaltation of the slain Lamb of Calvary. But human history is a train wreck of churches and regions abandoning the gospel. How does that happen? How do we move away from a reality that heaven can't get enough of? How does gospel shift take place? Sometimes in evangelism, people can present the gospel as training wheels. Do you remember the alphabet? You learned the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It was a ditty, it was a song. I don't know that it ever was a, a hit in the top 40 charts. You learned it so that you could learn letters, so that you could learn to read. It was a, a step to something. It was, it was foundational and really important. I was really embarrassed in sixth grade when I learned that Elemento was not a thing. It was just L-M-N-O. It hit me and I thought, oh, I haven't sung the alphabet song in a long time. And you don't need to sing the alphabet song after you've learned to read. But friends, you still need the good news of the lamb slain at Calvary after you believed. You don't graduate from it. You don't move on from it. You never get past it. As John Owen said, nothing but the death of Christ for us will be the death of sin in us. Understanding, rehearsing, maintaining, preaching, proclaiming, and believing the gospel all over again and again and again is the heartbeat of your putting to death sin in your own life and sanctification. It never abandons faith. It is a faith in the promises of God. It is a faith in the word of God. It is also a faith in the uh, prescriptions of God that come with a yielded will to those prescriptions. All of that is purchased by the cross of Christ. The faith required to suffer through temptation and yielded obedience is a faith modeled by Christ Listen, what does it mean in your temptations or in your repentances to contemplate Jesus as the sin bearer at the cross? As John Owen says, you can't visualize Jesus actually carrying your sins before the wrath of his Father at the cross. Consider all that it means for him to carry the staggeringly infinite weight of that justice and paying for it in his suffering. And then hold on to those darling sins as if they're cute. Now, we don't get past this. Now, sometimes evangelists talk about the gospel like it's your get out of hell free card. It's your ticket. You put it in your pocket. After you buy it, you pull it out when it's time to get on the train. You show somebody the ticket. Hey, yeah, I got that ticket. The ticket doesn't change your life, it just sits in your pocket till you need it. That is not the gospel. The gospel changes your life. Sometimes distracted Christians take the gospel for granted. You know, one generation fights for the gospel, fights to recover the gospel. You may think of the, 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 the Protestant Reformation. You may think of other eras in Christian history where the gospel was lost and then had to be fought to be recovered and understood all over again. And that generation understood what it cost to lose the gospel. 
and what it costs to fight to regain it. But the next generation accepts the gospel but doesn't understand what was at stake and the gospel moves ever so imperceptibly out of the center to the periphery. It becomes assumed. And we have other things to do too. The, the other things, really important things, slide into the center and then the next generation after that doesn't even know what the gospel is. Of course, there will always be skeptics of God's grace. They underestimate the power of God to transform lives while they overestimate their own ability for self-improvement. And they bank on their abilities to conform to some set of external behaviors rather than the faith fight of dependent obedience. And that what they wind up with is not real life change, not holiness that pleases God, but self-righteousness that leads to ruin. This is human religion, legalism properly. They don't need the transforming power of the gospel. They got this. A life yielded to God in obedience only comes from faith in the slain lamb. There were liberal theologians in the early 20th century in America that began to view a slain lamb as passe. All that blood, violence, and gore, that, that's not really for modern man. We're, we're beyond that. We, we've moved on to just love everybody and accept everybody. That was liberal theology. They were done with the, the unsophisticated remnants of a barbaric and pre-modern religion in their view. One theologian described it as an angry God placating his own wrath by a process of divine child abuse. That's just too much to stomach for 21st century people. They moved on from a slain lamb. The self-help gurus view self-improvement as important and, and maybe some Jesus in your life as an important part of that. You, you, you get some relationship to God and then you can start making real progress to a better you. And the gospel is in the rearview mirror as we have exchanged it for a series of self-improvement steps, tips and tricks and fads promising to make your temporal existence a little better. Missionaries can confuse the gospel with its fruits. Where humanitarian concerns subtly slide to the center and the message of the slain lamb is lost, it's nudged away, eventually forgotten because humanitarian concerns have overtaken. Innovators get bored by the gospel. They're looking for something new something trendy. They capitulate to the culture. They put their finger to the wind and say, what do people want to hear? Let's give them that. Listen, the elders of this church want to say the same old things for as long as they breathe on this earth. And they want to pass to another generation a love for the gospel that preaches the same gospel until they're dead, having passed on the same message to another generation. Yet, let us never get bored by that. And the real tragic irony in the last decade of maybe our circles of evangelicalism was what we might call the gospel-centered fad. It seemed like everybody was talking about the gospel all of a sudden, and this is thrilling and exciting, and an entire genre of music was called gospel hip-hop. And, and they claimed in their first generation, we just got to talk about the gospel every, all the time and we'll never stop. They stopped. As a genre, the, the substitutionary atonement, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross is not the center of the genre. It came and went. And there was a time where people would take the precious word gospel, put a hyphen after it, and then any other word after. And, and that had traction in evangelicalism. We love the gospel. And if I can put something I'm really interested in as a caboose on the gospel train, attach it to that, that gospel is going with all the energy and love and affection of the people who love the gospel and they can have my caboose too. So we can have gospel dieting. You just go, weight loss attached to substitutionary atonement? 
Everything became a gospel issue. Everybody's pet project, everybody's hobby, everybody's grave concerns about humanity got attached to the gospel in ways that obliterated the gospel, made us forget the gospel. The gospel's at the center of heaven. You can read D.A. Carson's really insightful depiction of this slide of pushing the gospel to the periphery by other things coming in, important things, good things coming in and pushing the gospel out in his book, The Cross and Christian Ministry. And he wrote that book before the gospel-centered fad got traction. It was prophetic in a loosely prophetic way. I just did this equipping hour on prophecy. I don't mean that. Scratch the tape. He was just really smart and insightful. Okay. I want to take some applications from Edward's sermon, The Excellency of Christ. Remember, he was talking about the lion and the lamb being so different and yet portraying the same person and how richly we ought to think of Christ. He is a being of diverse excellencies. Here's what Edward says. We, we can see why Christ was given so many different names and titles and, and depictions. He says, let the consideration of these diverse excellencies of Christ induce you to trust him as Savior. He says, what are you afraid of? That you dare not venture your soul on Christ. And what could you possibly desire in a Savior that Christ doesn't have? Let these considerations induce you to love him and allow him to be your portion. We could summarize Edward's application this way. What more do you want in a Savior than we find in Christ? What more could you want as a center of delight and enjoyment than you can find in Christ? What more could you want in a king than Christ? Oh, I don't want to tell anybody what to do. You're going to be king? How's that going to go? How has it gone so far? What more do you want? He's everything. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth I desire nothing but you. What do we do with this? Well, preach the gospel to yourself. As a daily practice, remind yourself that Jesus the Christ suffered, died, and rose again on your behalf to bring you to God. You need to hear it again. He forgave your sin, removed you from slavery to sin. He annihilated the condemnation due your sin, and he secured eternity for you in his glorious presence. Secondly, preach the gospel to the world. Take this indomitable message to everything that breathes. Third, apply the gospel to your sin. It's not all we do with our sin. You need to recognize it for what God is. You need to call it what God calls it. You need to preach the gospel to yourself in it. Meditate on the cross of Christ. And then you need to do the things that God says to do about your sin. Put off, put on, turn away from, pursue obediences and yielded faith. But right there in the center of all of that is the consideration all over again of the Lamb's work on the cross on my, des- on my best days, the gospel reminds me that my best works have need of forgiveness. And on my worst days, the gospel reminds me that I am an uncondemnable child of the Father. I have an advocate before the throne who laid down his life in my place. I am loved, forgiven, adopted, and secured. A fourth application for us, don't let peripheral things take over the center. Don't let good things take over the central things. Nothing gets the spotlight and center stage but the glory of God. And God has chosen to magnify and exalt his son, the lamb slain, in that center. And a fifth application, we'll we'll take our cue from Revelation 5 and the scene in heaven. Sing. Sing. Sing loud, sing together, raise a raucous cacophony of voices united around the glorification and exaltation of the slain Lamb of Calvary who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, King of kings and Lord of lords. There is no one like him. Let's pray.
and then we'll sing. Lord Jesus, you are king. Ferocious, mighty, terrifying. Your roar will silence all voices. And yet you came to the earth, a humble servant, a sacrificial lamb, who when mistreated, did not revile in return. You were in fact silent. Thank you. Thank you. We will sing one day without sin, without reservation, with all the redeemed from every tongue and tribe and nation and people, with all the myriads and myriads and thousands upon thousands of angels, with the four living beings, we will sing. And we pray that our worship here on this earth, mixed up as it is, imperfect as it is, laden and contaminated as it is, would be a preview of what is to come. It's in your name we pray. Amen.